It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. It's Friday, and that means I get to do my favorite thing, hear from Krista how I've messed up in today's Clark Stink segment. And also today, there's one thing that over time costs people substantial money when they're saving for retirement. And I want to tell you what it is and why I ask you to do it differently than we are programmed to do when we're saving for the future. But right now, it's time for Clark Stakes. These going to be fun today? I'll let you be the judge of that. Clark really dropped the ball on his description of why SVB failed Silicon Valley Bank. Being a retired federal bank examiner for 18 years, it is obvious that Clark is not an intimately aware of how banks are rated and supervised. All banks receive individual camel component ratings and composite ratings. Clearly, SVB had poor management and weak liquidity based on the level of long-term treasuries on their balance sheet. Further, the bank paid bonuses to senior staff just days before it failed. However, the FDIC, Fed, and Treasury covered for the terrible supervision oversight because many of the investors and loan customers were of a particular political party that donated to their party. The California state examiners and the SF San Francisco Fed should lose their jobs over this malfeasance. And that's from Keith. Keith, thank you. All right. So first of all, um, there's been a lot of stuff since the failure of this bank that's tried to draw everything here in the political environment, both directions, going after uh, people that are Democrats attacking Republicans, Republicans attacking Democrats, all that. What we have here is a typical made in America mess up. And it is not one that should be looked at through a political prism, although in today's culture, more likely everybody looks at everything through a, a political looking glass. So the failures to pr properly supervise in this case, and you're an expert in the field, but uh, that in this case with the size of this bank, it was principally a Federal Reserve function from the Federal, you mentioned the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco was not doing proper supervision. The other thing that has been um, talked about in the financial press, but not the public really hadn't heard about this, is it's private auditors for both of the banks that failed the same weekend, it was the same private auditors who both said everything was great. The issue with the long-dated treasuries. Okay, so a bank putting its reserves in treasuries is normally considered to be a very conservative kind of thing. What happened here to them and to others is they made the people doing cash management at the bank made a critical cash management error. They were buying long-term treasuries that are subject to enormous value fluctuation because of movements in interest rates and trying to squeeze out more yield from the reserves they needed instead of having money in short-term debt instruments. Everybody agrees on that, that that was the core of the problem, that the bank was adequately capitalized but used very poor strategy about how they handled their reserves, and that led to the meltdown. So the actual uh, losses to taxpayers, knock on wood, there's no wood to knock on. You knock on your head instead. Knock on my head. The actual losses to taxpayers from what has transpired here is likely to be pretty close to zero from this and the other emergency measures put in place, barring an unexpected event. And there can always be, as we learned in 2007 through 2012, there can always be additional unexpected events. But I believe that the failure of the bank was a federal oversight failure in part, but the way the federal agencies coordinated and handled it over the weekend it was not going to win them any friends, but I think they did the right thing. 
This is less of a Clark stinks and more of a Clark error of omission. You answered a question about 529 plans. If you don't know if your kid will be attending college, you mentioned you can roll the funds over to an IRA. Good info, just not complete. Please be sure and mention there's a $35,000 limit. This is important to know as many save more than that amount and you wouldn't want people using this as a Roth funding vehicle without understanding the limitations. You also said if they get a scholarship, you could roll over the funds to the IRA. I think you should have discussed the scholarship rules. In the case of a scholarship and non-qualified withdrawals up to the amount of the tax-free scholarship can be taken out penalty-free, but you'll have to pay income tax on those earnings. Thanks for keeping us in the mostly correct loop on so many things, Linda. Linda, thank you very much. Um, so yes, no question that was a sin of omission on my part. I've mentioned on other occasions the $35,000 limit did not in this case. And I should have, the reason I talk about a broad brush is even though there are people who save substantially more in a 529 plan than 35,000, it is a micro percent of people with 529 accounts. But they put that in there to not be a tax dodge for rich families to funnel huge amounts of money uh, one generation to another tax-free. Clark, you talk a lot about the 5% on gas you get back with the Sam's Club card, but I think it would behoove your listeners to understand that Sam's Club and Walmart gas is not the top tier rated, is not top tier rated like Costco. Most modern car manufacturers recommend top tier for better engine performance and longevity. I'm sure the 5% is good anywhere on gas, but not worth the 1% in savings if you fill up at Sam's regularly. Also, you talk all about you talk about toilet paper too much and don't mention that Walmart, White Cloud is their brand, and Sam's are both better rated than Charmin and Costco via Consumer Reports and they are comparably priced, Brad. So Brad, after the Consumer Reports thing came out, I went and bought um, the White Cloud from my family and they didn't agree with Consumer Reports. Um, but there are people who really enjoy the white cloud. I thought it was fine. My family did not, and it was top rated. Okay, so as for the top tier gas, I've always recommended top tier gas, and it is my failure that I was not aware that if you are correct, that Sam's Club and Walmart do not sell top tier gas. Top tier gas is a standard that just as Brad said, that is designed to make sure that the gasoline you're buying is the best it can be to be safe for modern vehicles. Clark, you're always hawking Consumer Reports subscriptions. I'm just waiting for you to show up at my front door with a subscription postcard and a rainbow vacuum. I get every issue of Consumer Reports for free on the Flipster app by logging in with my public library card. I love old school magazines, but haven't had to buy one in years. Sean. Sean, thank you. You know, Consumer Reports is an oddball, unusual organization. They're, the, they're like the last one standing that in order to make sure they're unbought and unbossed, take advertising from no one, and everything to fund their research is from subscriptions. And uh, I think I've shared with you, they get very upset with me talking about their stuff because they feel like, hey, I'm giving away the goods and then nobody has a need to subscribe to the magazine. But yes, I've talked about the library for a long time. Love your recommendation of the Flipster app. Flipster app is to, you can see all mag, like tons of magazines through the public library system for the libraries that participate. Clark, you told people to use the online system for passport renewal from the U.S. State Department. I did, and after 10 weeks, my renewal application is still in received status. The next status in process is supposed to take the longest amount of time, and now they've paused the online renewals due to a backlog. I should have mailed it in. The average turnaround is less than 42 days on mail-in renewals. Peter, and I did have a couple people write in about this issue. Peter, and to everyone else complaining, I am so sorry. The State Department said that the new system for standard renewals was going to be much more streamlined and much quicker, that they did a pilot, I think two pilots first, to make sure they had the bugs out of it. Obviously, they were wrong, and my passing on that advice 
has turned out to harm people, and I'm really sorry about that. Ultimately, no doubt, the online system will be a better way to do passport renewals. Obviously not working right now. I listen to the podcast daily on my phone. Then I look at the links I'm interested in. That's in our show notes under the podcast. My gripe is that after every show, I click on a link that has at least one pop-up saying I have to subscribe to read past the first few sentences, most notably the Wall Street Journal. Being fo- forced to subscribe doesn't seem in keeping with the Clark way. Could you please post links that are free to read and don't require me to provide personal info just to be read? Tracy. Tracy, okay, we talk about this a lot because uh, everybody's going behind paywalls. Um, It is how they're trying to survive in what was traditionally looked at as uh, print journalism, I guess would be the term, Mm -hmm. and now it's electronic. And when it was print, it was just accepted. You had to pay to buy this newspaper, this magazine, uh, this public this that or the other publication well now we've gotten so used to with the internet being to go pop, 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 on our phone or on a laptop and there's anything we want to know for free may not be true or may not be accurate but is there and so you've got this awkward phase nobody's really figured out with uh traditional um it's an overused word but traditional journalism outlets that have to have a business model that's sustainable for them and they're trying to make paywalls work and i don't know how with a lot of the stuff we talk about how to get you access to stuff i know that's really going to be solid that is not behind one of these paywalls but yes we are fully aware of the frustration you have and everybody else has on this issue. And you pay for subscriptions to lots of I pay for so many subscriptions. See these glasses? I just got my new, those of you who watch the video version, just had my eyes test again, and my eyes were worse again because I read way too much. Clark, you poor unfortunate soul. You don't stink as much as Corella DeVille, but you don't fully understand Disney timeshares called Disney Vacation Club or DVC. You said the math does not work in your favor, but the math definitely does work for some people. If you want to stay at deluxe level resorts on Disney property and go to Disney at least once every three years, it will definitely be cheaper long term to buy into the DVC than pay Disney's expansive hotel rates. Also, the three DVC timeshares I've bought in the last eight years, I could sell each for 30 to 50 percent higher the one I purchased them for. Doesn't that tell you something is different about the Disney product? I can go over it personally with you over a dull whip in the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> Love your show and all the great advice, Douglas. Douglas, thank you. All right, so Disney loyalists are more loyal, I think, than any humans on Earth. And we have had a number of people who took great offense to me saying that even though There's marketability with the Disney timeshares that the reading I've done found that most people still end up upside down, that you end up having something that does not, in fact, grow in value or stay at what you paid for it. But Douglas, you and several others have been very unhappy with me and felt that I'm not seeing the real picture and the true picture of the Disney timeshares. You stinky, stinky, dirty, nasty boy. In Whoa! Today's, in today's episode where you were answering listener questions, you had a slight slip of the tongue. You reveal to your audience that you review the questions ahead of time and prepare for them. It's totally fine that you prepare for your listeners' questions, but we, the audience, are under the impression that you are hearing them for the first time and are answering them off the cuff. It's time to clear the rotten, smelly air. Do you or don't you prepare for your listener questions, David? So, David, I don't look at the listener questions till um, uh, typically one minute before we start the podcast. And I just glance through the questions for that podcast just so if there's something that I'm not aware of at all or don't understand at all, that I'm not going to waste your time with Krista reading it and then I have no response. But there's no... Um, there's no advanced prep. I mean, it is like a speed reading glance of them because of the fact that there are so many different topics out there and there'll be some that I would say, huh, I don't get what that's about. 
and that would be the only case. There's no then going and prepping and trying to find information. So I really am hearing them essentially cold when Krista reads them. Stinky advice about searching for a credit union. You said search at ncua.org on the show, but it's actually ncua.gov. Right. And it's actually cuna.org to really search for yeah. a credit union. So I, I, okay, this has been a problem in my brain for 30 years that I will interchangeably talk about ncua.gov and cuna.org and mess up the gov and org for both of them. CUNA is the trade association for the credit unions. NCUA.gov is the federal oversight like FDIC for banks. And I blame your stinky producer for not catching that, and that would be me. Okay, I got uh, several about this. Clark, I just listened to a podcast about an employee who did not have federal taxes taken out their first year. Please be kind to those of us who work in payroll. My educated guess is this probably wasn't a clear clerical error on the payroll team's part. I work in payroll and have worked in multiple systems, and I've seen this time and time again based on how the employees enter their W-4 information. I noticed that after they changed the W-4 in 2020, when employees can't claim $4,000 or two dependents or more, they tend not to have enough taxes taken out or have nothing taken out at all. This is not something the employer controls, but I believe is a problem with the new tax tables, trying to put more money in each week into the employer employee's pocket, but it doesn't take into account other income that an employee may have from a spouse or second job. Christina. Christina, thank you. No one has ever pointed that out to me before, and I appreciate that very much. And Christina, your post is exactly why we do Clark Stinks, because none of us can know everything about a particular industry or a particular situation, and it's so very helpful when you take the time, become a member of Team Clark, and post that, and it's something for which I will be aware of in the future that I would not have known without you and the others who posted pretty much the similar thought. Thank you so much. And coming straight ahead, and by the way, if you do have a Clark Stinks that occurs to you, clark.com slash Clark Stinks. Coming straight ahead, I want to talk about IRAs for a minute and something that people are in the habit of doing that I don't normally recommend. So we have tax day coming up in a few weeks and it is completely normal that people wait to fund an IRA for the last year, in this case for 22. It's one of the things you can go back in time that you are in a way back machine. And you can do a contribution before you do your income tax for a traditional IRA or a Roth before you file your 22 return in 23. And it's as if you did so last year. And everybody's always thought, this is great. This is great. But is it really? Okay. So the key with investing is time in the machine. Not the Wayback Machine, it's time in the machine. The longer you have money at work investing for you, even with the ups and downs of the market, remember most, you look through history, most years are up, not down. So if you're always contributing behind, instead of contributing as you go, you're losing two things. You're losing that time in the market and you're losing the opportunity to do dollar cost averaging because you even out the ups and downs of the market if you let's say you want to do uh whatever amount let's say it's uh forty eight hundred dollars a year you want to put in a Roth or a traditional but you know I love the Roth you just put 400 in every month and you keep doing it or whatever amount it is you want to put in up to the max depending on your age and you put that in every month going forward. You have built a habit. You're contributing to your Roth IRA or the traditional. You're getting that money in there. You're giving it time to work. And over the years, you will find that the steady-as-you-go path builds real wealth over time. There is an exception. The exception 
are people that irregularly work or earn relatively um, small amounts potentially of money and you don't know how much you're actually going to be allowed to put into an IRA. Happens a lot with kids that a um, teenager will be working and last year they had this much earnings and this year they have this much less and whatever. So you could over contribute to an IRA and then you got a lot of stuff to do to get that fixed. So with people whose income is very irregular, it makes sense to do it the way most people do it, and that is they contribute in the spring, they're contributing for the prior year. But remember, it should be the exception, not the rule. It needs to be for people who have that earnings uncertainty. One other thing I covered a couple months ago, I want to mention again if you didn't hear it, if you or someone you know is a moderate income earner, you may be eligible for federal matching money on up to half to a portion of what you put in a retirement account. But it's money you got to know is there and you got to ask for it and you do that through your tax return. Krista? Josh in Michigan says, my teenage son will be traveling to Cuba for a week-long missions trip this summer. Cuba is not included under T-Mobile's international coverage, so talk is $2 a minute and 50 cents for texting. Is there a cheaper way to keep in contact that we could set up before the trip? So what people do with Cuba, uh, the Cuba communication thing is a real problem, is when you get to Cuba, when your son gets to Cuba, your son can buy a prepaid internet card. And there's, uh, haphazardly, there's internet cafes and, and places you can use the internet in Cuba. And the cards are not terribly expensive, but also your son's going to be busy with his friends. He's going to be busy on mission. But there'll be an opportunity with one of the internet prepaid cards that are sold from when he gets to Cuba and throughout the country, he'll be able to buy them and he'll be able to communicate uh, by email. And if you have one of those universal messaging systems, you can use for instant messaging from a computer to a phone, from a phone to a computer, you'll be able to communicate when he's online on a computer. So that's really the best answer there is uh, for him to get one of those. Keep, leave his phone, if he just takes his phone, leave his phone in airplane mode and use the prepaid card on his phone. Can you, I wonder if they have WhatsApp, if they allow you to use WhatsApp in Cuba. That would be a good way to text too, yeah. the internet card. You know, it's always, when you're in a communist country, it's always iffy what you're allowed to use and what you're not allowed to use. Kevin in Indiana says, I've had an Epson XP430 oh, for many oh. years and it has worked great. I recently updated my firmware, and now it will not recognize my generic ink cartridges. Keep in mind, it did recognize them before the firmware update. First, I wanted to make sure everyone's aware of this. And second, is this something happening in the printer industry? I'm super disappointed by Epson as their ink is double the price of the generic. This is terrible. You know, uh, Hewlett Packard just got a wave of uh, negative publicity for doing this same garbage with the firmware. Epson was not in any of the stories. Now you're telling me Epson's doing this as well. So there's this war going on where um, Hewlett Packard started it. They started selling printers below their cost and subsidizing the printers because all the money is in the ink. I mean, if you filled up your car, if your car could run on Hewlett Packard ink or Epson ink, it would cost you to buy eight gallons of gas, apparently $56,000. Um, it's just unbelievable what they do. And the weird thing, Epson has its line of uh, Ecotech printers that run on virtually free ink, but you pay a real market price for the printer. And then they have the printers like yours that work on the Hewlett Packard model that they sell the printers at a loss so they can make all the money on the ink. So then they're all like, wait a minute. So the gig's up. People are going and they're buying all this third-party ink, not paying us the rip-off prices we want to rip you off with on the ink. So then uh, what Hewlett-Packard and Epson are doing is they're using 
DRM, digital rights management, as a way to kill the printer because you put in non-Epson or non-Hewlett Packard ink. This is outrageous. Two suggestions. One, uh, one that uh, we heard from a listener, and that is, instead of buying an inkjet printer, buy a laser printer. Many of them have a very, very low cost per page. You're print printing typically plain black ink on white paper, but most of what people print, that is what you need. Or you look at buying one of the Epson Eco Tanks, which I've been really happy with over the years, but Krista hates. Or third, if you have one of these already, don't update your firmware. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's in all the tech stuff. Do not be fooled by Hewlett Packard or Epson or any other printer. When they say firmware update available, ignore it. Don't update it. Stacy in North Carolina says, my husband ordered a cover for our hot tub in October and paid by credit card. In November, the company sent him an email saying that they were running 16 to 26 weeks for orders. He called again two weeks ago and no one has returned his call. I looked up the company with the BBB and it shows that the Florida Attorney General has filed a lawsuit against the company two months ago and it has one out of five star rating. My question is this, what should our next step be? Do we wait 26 weeks and then file with the credit card company? Contact the Florida Attorney General. Thanks for all you do and I never think you stink, LOL. <laughs> but I do, I do. <laughs> uh, okay, so Stacy, this is no fun here. Because your ironclad rights with the credit card ran out um, October, November, in December, and here we are well in the spring. Doesn't mean you're dead, though, with the credit card company, because there may be holdbacks on this company because of, obviously, prior issues and problems. Go ahead and put it into dispute with your credit card company for failure to deliver the goods. And you never got the merchandise. And then they will choose whether they say, oh, well, you're past 60 days, go have a nice life. Or they will send it on to the merchant processor for this company. The danger you face is that uh, with the problems they're showing with the BBB, the ratings you see online with the Florida Attorney General suing them, this may be a company that's going to go toast with your money and many other people's money. So that's why I think it's fine for you to file a complaint. Uh, they're not responding to BBB. File a complaint with the Florida Attorney General's office, be on record with that, and dispute with your credit card immediately. And I'm really sorry this has happened to you. Um, this industry, I don't know why. I can't tell you why, but the pool and spa industry has been one that's been a source of complaints since I started doing this in the mid-80s. It's, it's got a lot of good players in it, but it's always been an industry that's had its, unfortunately, large numbers of fly-by-nights. And so you did the right thing by paying by credit card, but really important, anytime you buy something that you're going to receive later, when you're getting close to that 60th day and you haven't received the goods, Dispute the charge just to preserve your rights. The merchandise later shows up, you release your dispute, but you have preserved your time rights that are the, the explicit rights, which is the 60 days. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Remember, we have information for you around the clock at Clark.com and ClarkDeals.com with deals you can trust and information you can trust for your wallet. Have a great one.